We were passionate about helping women. We wanted them to be protected. If I hadn't took that leaflet and I just walked past the guy, who knows what I'd have been doing or you know where I'd have uh, gone. So we started to to ask, is it uh, the truth? What the what the media um, say to us? When I came here, I was 10 years old. I didn't want to come here, but I had no choice, just like any other easy person who has come to Europe. And these are the people who don't believe in the hereafter. They don't believe in the hereafter. They don't believe that they will be accountable on the day of Kiara. There is no one who can believe organized genocide is really out of our consideration. My name is Yasmin Malbacus, I'm from London. I grew up in Derby. You know, in 1996, we, we saw genocide taking place in Bosnia, and then we also saw the influx of Somali refugees. And I started waking up to the fact that, yes, you know, the Muslim countries are being attacked. And because I felt the injustices that were, was done towards me, I could empathize then. This is when we then formed our women's group. The whole purpose was to become the voice, the eyes and the ears of the Muslims. I suppose the changing point in my life was the whole thing with Bosnia. When I got given that video cassette of the uh, massacres in Bosnia and Croatia and going home and watching it, uh, as a consequence of that, I think that sort of changed my whole direction. I was compelled to do something to help the people because what I saw was genocide taking place and the bottom line was that on the ground level, people were dying, people were suffering. In the summer of 2030, my friend uh, told me that, that I have to read the, the Quran. And so I say, okay, good, I, I read it. It makes, makes my, my heart heart beat if I read uh, that, uh, that the Islam is the truth. I have to pray my, my God, my, my God who, who created me. My uh, friend and me, we, we are looking to places where Muslims are um, hitting. We come to this point if we, if we are Muslims. Our task is to help Muslims, to, to help um, other families in the world from uh, people they, they hitting. I think about uh, leaving my family, leaving my friends. It's uh, horrible to, to leave, but I decided to, uh, to, to go with my friend to Turkey and then to, to go to Syria. My mum and dad always taught me to ask questions and it's like, if you, if you believed in something then you stood up for it, but it was always about knowing the facts. So I wanted to stand up against you know, terrorism, but as 15 you don't really know what you're going to do. Somebody said to me about the National Front, oh, I just thought, you know, they had these black people, they wanted to send black people home. And other than that, I didn't really know much about them. And you had a lot of guys who actually liked, you know, they'd be walking over the National Front badge on just to get a reaction. You know, people would just walk up and give you a five and walk off and you think, you know, well, what was that all about? And they just silenced for the cause. Because I was actually involved in the far right for 20 years. And it was only in the last sort of three years that I started to question everything. In 2007, um, Al-Qaeda bombed Sinja. Um, where the biggest Yazidi community is. And my dad, at that point, he said, we have no choice but to get you here as soon as possible. I remember that day when, at four in the morning, I had to wake up and go to the airport. I, you know, I, I was telling my mom, I don't want to go. I don't want to go, but my mom, I remember her telling me, like, Are you always nervous that you will, you will lose your mom you will lose your family, which I was. I was terrified every time I went to school that I would come back and my mom won't be there or one of my siblings won't be there. And that's, at that point, it just, it just clicked for me like I had no choice but to go. Whenever you join a new group, everything is so hunky-dory, you know, so you, you get on with all the sisters, but then you see that things are not always rosy. 
and studying about the Prophet, peace be upon him, and looking at what we were implementing over here or how we were interacting with the public was totally different. I've heard this great scholar say that Islam is known for its dominions and not for its domination. It's not to dominate. And that's when slowly but surely the bubble was bursting. When I look back, you know, I made, I made quite a few mistakes after I went to Bosnia and I didn't get involved with some unscrupulous characters. But a lot of that was because I didn't actually have the information, I didn't have the understanding, I was a bit naive and I didn't have any guidance. I was lucky that I managed to not get too caught up in it. If we're talking about in the news, you know, it's always the same kind of talking about the problems of integration and isolation with Muslim communities in the UK. You know, there's like the Muslims and there's everyone else, you know, like we don't understand you and there's nobody in the media to tell us what you guys really do, except for the fact that you blow things up and get really angry about stuff. For me it was paradise because I don't feel this uh, atmosphere like, like here in Germany. One week we, we live in a, in a house, only live in a house, pray and it was all normal. After one week we have to go one by one in the um, office. He asked me um, what, what I wanted to do, uh, to do here in Syria. First thing was to drive by, by a car with bombs. Uh, second was to, to, to fight on the, on the front line. And third was uh, to fight with a bomb. This was uh, the point I, I know that I was at a uh, terrorist uh, organization. Decided to leave my house, leave my job, and then basically just head off to a different city. I lived above an Asian guy's shop for a couple of years. I just sat and went through that whole process. You know, the guy was brilliant. Um, I was doing all the hours God sent, he started weren't eating properly, so we'd, I'd sit down with the Asian family, they'd feed me, and again it was like, you know, all these years I'd been doing all this stuff, uh, you know, and I was, I was just completely wrong. I just thought, you know what, it's not about race or nationality, it's about individuals. You know, people look at me and they say, well, you know, once a Nazi, always a Nazi. It's not an easy thing to tell somebody, you know, I used to be in combat, I the National Front, for me, I just felt I had to put something back into the community. If you talk about recent counter-terrorism legislation, none of it was formulated with the sort of cooperation of the Muslim community. At the end of the day, it's a problem that affects us more than anything. You know, we feel like we need to be consulted, and the Muslim community over the last so many years has not been consulted, you know, and I want to see this problem resolved as much as anybody. It's been nearly uh, uh, 25, 27 years now since I saw that video cassette and when I look, when I think back on my journey of all the places that I've been, um, I think it put me into a, a position where I kind of like sort of saw things a lot more clearly and I've kind of used that over the years to try to help my community, try to help young people to understand the complexities of uh, the society that they live in. I feel hopeless sometimes, like there's nobody doing it and doing anything and I'm trying my best to try and get people to understand what's happening. I set up my campaign on Change.org. It's gone to the to media all around the world. I've spoken to leaders um, about it and handed in my petition once to Parliament again. I mean, the British public have been so helpful in, in terms of um, supporting me and my campaign. If you want to do something, um, go and you know get your local MP we just need to tell the government again and again until we get what we want but there's girls out there who are different faiths they're girls they're humans they shouldn't go through that once we have taken the veil of prejudices out you know away from our eyes that's when we will be able to see humanity again and that's why I say to a lot of people that Whenever someone comes to dictate, you have the right to challenge them. Because remember, one day we're going to be questionable to the one above. Not every, um, every man who, who go to Syria is a, is a terrorist. You, you have to look uh, to the specific history of the, of the people who go there. If the politicians don't listen, the effect is extremism, and from extremism leads on to terrorism. So you need to allow pressure groups from whatever cause to be heard and somebody needs to listen to them.
but if you don't, you just cause a massive problem.